Well, hopefully you guys have been enjoying the day so far. I think uh, we have to thank the people that have contributed their time to be here and uh, donate uh, their knowledge, their networking capability. But I think we have to also thank the audience for staying with us and taking valuable time from their worker to be here. And of course, the uh, sponsors and exhibitors as well. We call usually the last uh, session the graveyard shift, which is the last session of the day. But I, I think it's important, which means that if you stay this long, that means that this is important to you. And I think we have a, an important topic uh, to discuss. And to discuss this topic, obviously, we have a mixed panel that covers uh, many areas. We have people that are from the UAE. We have people that have implemented this technology in different jurisdictions, and we have people from the financial sector, so it allows us to give a complete overview of this. In this specific panel, there's some key words that I think are extremely important. One is the word uh, blockchain. What does this technology provide? Trust, and the decentralization, and many other elements. But the second key word is, I call it regulation, because things don't work Although some people originally wanted to create something that is anti-everything, but I think we need to have a balance. I think another important key word is the word investment, because without investment, we don't have the necessary elasticity to stretch uh, the solutions that we're putting together. The fourth word that I think is important is MENA, means uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa because this is kind of a region that inter-cooperates together and uh, Dubai has kind of become a hub for this entire region. I think we have to thank very much uh, Dubai, but also Emirates Airlines, which has established a lot of that. And the last important key word, you can call it digital transformation, digitalization, which was originally uh, coined as part of Gardner Group's uh, white papers, so how we combine all these four key elements together? So first, I have a very simple format. I get each of the panel members to spend a few minutes introducing themselves and maybe their small perspective on this topic for two to three, four, five minutes. And then we'll go to three or four elements uh, about these elements of regulation, uh, investment, MENA, and then we'll have some uh, closing uh, remarks from each one. If we have a bit of extra time, we'll also go to the audience for questions and answers. So I'll start with, uh, I usually say to the right, because being in the Middle East for a long time, I'll try to go to the last chair. i start with Mr. Aldori, so please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, George. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Jafar Aldori, uh, the Head of Strategic Partnerships at Lead Ventures and the Private Office of Finance with Juma bin Maktoum al -Maktoum. Um, we've been working in the crypto space for quite some time and we're working very closely with many of the government entities on building uh, blockchain and, and, the, and their initiatives on the blockchain adoption. So I think it, it gives us a lot of insights on what the government uh, are thinking about and what initiatives do they have towards the, uh, towards the blockchain adoption. So I think it's uh, it's, a, it's a good topic to talk about and, and, and share some insights on what's happening with the government and, and uh, try to be uh, as, as fruitful as possible. So thank you so much, it's an honor to be here. We also have the unique pleasure of having somebody that I usually just used to call Habeb, but now I have to call Your Excellency <laughs> Habeb. Gabriel Abed, uh, because he's uh, become an ambassador from Barbados to the United Arab Emirates. So it's kind of interesting his evolution of this role. So he can also give us an immense perspective because of his uh, worldwide experience as well as the overseas experience and implementation, or you can say one of the first implementations of CBDC or central bank uh, digital currency. Please, Abed. Thank you, George. Uh, so my history in the cryptocurrency race, um, blockchain race, has been quite broad and, and rich over the years. Uh, started off in the little island nation in the Caribbean called Barbados. Uh, we focused on uh, bringing to life the world's first central bank digital currency. Um, as we know today, it's probably 
a subject that the majority of central banks around the world went on to focus on things like bonds and ai systems but recently the government of barbados has embarked on a digital diplomacy agenda of which i've been sequestered to serve as the ambassador of barbados to united arab emirates where we would be looking at how technology and blockchain applies to the, the traditional world of diplomacy and how that can assist uh, two nations in or multiple nations in their bilateral relationships and the types of events that they can undertake. I have a, a, a history with the World Economic Forum in helping with the latest endeavor releasing a paper on the crypto-based uh, regulatory environment um, from a global perspective that was released early in September. Um, I advise everyone to have a read on it. It gives a very good oversight of what's happening uh, in the global markets as it relates to regulation in this industry. And I think today's topic is quite relevant uh, for anyone looking at what the type, what the right moves are as it pertains to investments and regulation uh, within the blockchain ecosystem. And we have uh, now a completely different perspective from investment, Oliver Koba, which is uh, um, from the financial sector, investment funds, I probably messed up the name, but I'll try my best. Please. Okay, thanks. George? Thank you. I'm really thrilled to still see so many people at the last session. And thank you so much for the great organization, really amazing event. About me, um, yeah, I'm Paolo Tavanger, and I am the co founder and investment director of Genesis Capital. Uh, where I'm heading the arbitrage fund and also looking at some of the existing P investments. Uh, but how I'm relevant here, um, actually we recently launched a blockchain-based project. And also part of my story, which is I'm going to tell very shortly, I'm very happy to be part of the topic, talking about regulation and investment in the MENA region of blockchain, because probably if I was not based in Dubai, I would never go into Technology and fintech this happened like a few years back because literally here everything is booming. <coughs> Sorry. There are so many government initiatives and it's really the perfect spot to be and meet people. So this is how I came to the sector too. I was planning from finance and then just connecting with people at events like that, you know, we came to where we are today and we have a whole fintech arm. So yeah, thank you so much for having me on the panel. We're going to start by what we sometimes call the elephant in the room, which is really the thing people don't like to talk about. As you know, some of the initial uh, venture into blockchain kind of created by what we sometimes call cyberpunks, which people trying to go against the existing establishment. So we have obviously some regulatory changes worldwide, which are covered by the paper that Gabrielle talked about. But we also have some local advancements. Um, I travel all the way around the region, so we have things like, for example, regulatory sandbox that started in Bahrain about three years ago, and it established the connection between this new world of blockchain and the traditional banking world. So it, it allows you to actually have uh, something that is fully regulated. So I would like back to Bala, and we we'll, we'll go back in this direction. So we start. What you see are the importance of regulation, what are the changes, both regionally here in Dubai, but also more wide in Bahrain or other areas, and what importance does that bring to the successful implementation of this technology? Well, as I already mentioned, here in the UAE, definitely the government is pioneer into regulating blockchain and crypto. There are so many legislations in the free zone, so I think uh, let me not say something wrong, but I think that it's like one of the very few governments that has taken the initiative to by 2021, which is now. Already many of the transactions are happening on the blockchain only, which I find really thrilling. And of course, this attracts so many invest investors as well as companies. As we can see here, like so many international companies coming here for the regulation only, because I think that it's so important to be regulated when it comes to 
being scalable. To get actually investors and grow your business, uh, you need to have a proper regulatory framework to bring this trust in. And also, I think Saudi Arabia is really um, the second one in the region implementing so, um, so many innovations. Um, I believe Sama, also working with the central bank, they implemented recently a blockchain structure for international payments, which is also really, really exciting because we're seeing here not only on startup level, but governments themselves implementing blockchain. Uh, so a lot of opportunities here, I believe, as I mentioned already, and a lot of new companies coming. So it's a really, it's a really nice spot to be in terms of regulation. Actually, you brought a very interesting point. Uh, we call sometimes in the region as Sharia compliant or Islamic finance. As you know, some of the blockchains uh, that are out there are already also what we call Islamic compliant. And uh, when we go sometimes outside of the region, we tend to call to this as ethical finance. So not to, to get people to have in, be more inclusive in the approach towards uh, having a more uh, integrated. But Gabriel obviously has a unique perspective given the travels that he has made and the implementation. So I'd like to see his perspective of uh, how regulatory is changing everything. And maybe we can even mention maybe El Salvador or some other places around the world that are pioneering all these great changes and more closer to the region as well. Okay. Well, I, I think it's pretty important like anything else in life that there's a balance. And, and that's one of the key things that we need to take into account right now with regulation. On one side of it, uh, too much regulation and you're hurting the innovation that we know today as blockchain. On the other side of it, too little regulation and what you end up having is the end consumer or systemic risk being exposed on an economy. And neither which scenarios you want to see in today's markets. Now, there's also a, a pretty interesting disposition that are some cryptocurrencies right for regulation? And it's less about, to me, less about the technology and more about the activity happening around the technology. For example, let's talk about something like Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin has introduced a new concept of where the regulation comes from code. And that code allows us to have an open consensus driven algorithm that defines the operational mandates of how that environment occurs, how it operates, and how it works. But on the outset of that, you have activities that occur around this technology, trading, uh, payment gateways for buying and selling, moving money in and out. And of course, when you're talking about these types of activities that touch on the traditional facets of the finance market, this is where regulators need to step in and observe, understand, and do the right, put the right mechanisms in place to protect those who are otherwise be vulnerable. Now, I would precursor that by saying the most important component of this entire thing is education. If you don't have an educated regulator, then they're not going to be able to understand what they're doing with the technology. And unfortunately, for some regulators, the technology is running very far ahead of the educational curve. So there's a massive gap in the ability or the need to catch up on education to where we are today with these technologies. Now, we have seen the landscape change dramatically from where it was four, five, six, eight years ago. And I can speak from a position of experience that originally Bitcoin was broadly unregulated but it was shrouded in all of these negative connotations of what it was as a technology. Fast forward to today, it is well understood, and we have various types of regulatory bodies globally, uh, with their heads well wrapped around the technology, understanding the technology, and making available the right licenses or the right conditions for the right types of activities to occur. So, I would say that, uh, if I could go back to my original statement, there is a need, and we're, we're seeing that right now, luckily enough, where there is not too far left or too far right being taken by majority of regulators. And a very good example of that is the United States, observing what the US has done where multiple conversations are happening at various regulatory bodies, and we're also even seeing things like important topics reaching into the infrastructure bill. 
we recently saw that. We saw the effect of what that had on the American markets and the crypto markets in general. So I'm, I'm going to stop there, there Jaffer's words on the topic, but if I can end it with uh, the key component is education, and the secondary to that is finding a balanced playing field of not, uh, of not stifling or hurting innovation while protecting consumers' system, systemic risk and the overall and overarching economy. Jafar, you work for one of the important family offices in the region, uh, named in Dubai by Kaktoum. So obviously you're kind of also in yourself an ambassador to the implementation of new technologies through the changes that you're driving in the ecosystem. What is your perspective in the regulatory uh, view? I, I appreciate the compliment, uh, but uh, if I want to touch on local basis regulations, I think that the central bank along with uh, ESCA, Security and Commodities Authorities, have already shown so much interest in, in, in regulating uh, the cryptocurrencies. Uh, the most important thing that we have to talk about, and I think Gabriel has already uh, touched on, is basically the education, right? So everyone knows it's a, blockchain is a new topic, it's a new technology that comes along with the cryptocurrencies and, and the uh, virtual assets. So finding the right advisors um, internationally that can help us with the journey to the right regulations and and maintaining the balance of under-regulating and over-regulating, I think this is very important to, to maintain a, st a stable position in the, in the crypto community globally. Um, so education is one key point that the government are, are working on. I think the UAE has, has always been uh, keen on implementing new regulations and, new, and attracting new technologies. However, they have always been uh, very smart when it comes to regulating in, in a way that they monitor what's happening internationally and they try to learn from the failures and actually uh, implement the success stories globally. So uh, from my perspective, I don't mind it takes its time to, to be regulated. That's not a problem, but um, the most important thing is to, is to be implemented correctly. Now from ESCA's side, what we're like, uh, and this is general knowledge to everyone, is that there are three types of licenses that ESCA have been working on, and, and they have been working on it for quite some time um, in terms of utility tokens and, and security tokens. Now, of course, for the payment tokens, that's something that has to do with the central bank and uh, along with the CBDC, and that is something that will happen in the long run, but I think we're we're right around the corner in terms of in terms of utility tokens regulations and and tokenization of assets and uh, and exchange platforms and brokerage uh, regulation. So I again I don't mind that we take our time in terms of the regulations, but I think that Dubai has already done the hard work in attracting the right people into the UAE. And the government's job right now is to filter out the BS, basically, the, the, the scammers that have come along with that exposure. So I think the, uh, it's going to happen uh, sooner than later, but uh, I'm sure it's going to happen in the right way. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, this is something that is very important. All the existing ongoing conferences in Dubai, and I think in the month of October, there's something like 50 events related to blockchain alone, they're under the microscope. So the regulator is checking of who's the audience of speakers, uh, presenters, etc., to make sure they get briefed correctly about the approach of what is correct, what is allowed to be said, and what uh, is to be avoided. One thing that is also interesting about Dubai is the innovation in the area of ministries. Uh, we had the Ministry of Happiness, which call it almost the statistics ministry to try to figure out what to change. But other two important ones is the Ministry of AI and obviously uh, just very close the Ministry of Possibilities. I invite you to research online and you can see that 
all of this is really about innovation. But innovation requires one important element, and it's the development of investment, smart investment, smart money. So let me go back to Paula, and we come back to the topic of what are the winds of change, uh, and what is the winds of change that we see investment in this new area of technology, specifically in the region, uh, in the MENA region. Well, in terms of investment, I think that I already mentioned that regulation is a very important point. So basically, giving the stage to the companies to uh, expose themselves to investors, to the banks, but also to have a legal, legally registered company uh, and have a license. I think that, again, UAE and also Saudi has great initiatives for that, like sandboxes and um, like a scale up programs. Um, co-working spaces, because as we know, most of the companies in the very initial stage, um, they're bootstrapping, so you need to provide an environment to develop and as well be able to meet with potential investors and to ensure that these investors that they have the legal structure to do that. So I think that so far in the UAE we have, uh, we have a few um, major hubs which are offshore and we have uh, we have the DFC, the FinTech Hive doing a lot, we have ADGM, which I think that they were the first to have the crypto legislation in the region. So the right steps are being taken. Uh, in my opinion, um, in my opinion, regulation has a double edge. So sometimes too much regulation or some, most of these new projects are innovation. And it's very difficult to determine what in what framework they should work, because you cannot really compare it to anything existing already. So partially, when the regulation is too strict, it might cut off very important aspects of the project. And of course, this, um, this impacts the investment too, because investors are just on the other uh, direction from the regulators. They want to invest in the craziest projects and something that will really change the world. So I think that you know it's very important to find the right balance between um, between giving the freedom to the new companies to create and also to protect their eventual consumers at later stage. Uh, so as I'm saying there are enough programs, maybe having more and more programs like that. There are a few other groups that I know around Dubai and as well in Saudi currently doing the same, basically giving the exposure to the startups and all of these, you know, um, networking events with investors are really helping and I'm repeating and repeating the same thing, but due to COVID, there was literally nothing happening around the world, so we saw a lot of startups coming here to get this exposure and these hubs. So I think that UA had done a really great job on that. So Gabrielle, what do you see as the winds of change um, in the area of investment? Where is the key sparking plugs that are uh, trying to introduce better innovation and focus in this uh, market? There's been a couple of changes, uh, George. Um, I've been around the space for a hot minute, been around quite a few conferences and events, and one of the notable changes that you're seeing is back in the day, you used to go to an event and some guys in jeans and a pair of sneakers and a t-shirt would come on stage and pitch a project that you absolutely knew was no good for an investor, whether retail or institutional. But today, and, and this is to uh, the, the smartness of the regulators here and the authorities, where they've made it very clear, we like blockchain technology, we want to see innovation occur, we don't want to see projects being pitched that can hurt investors. And they've done a great job of ensuring that quality is being, is being shared with the crowd. That's one of the major changes that we've seen, the type of, the type of quality in projects being shared. The second major change that we have seen is, of course, the institutional investors have started coming. As of 2018, 2019, more specifically 2020, and now in 2021, more than ever, we are seeing the institutional investors arrive within this industry, and that is because of regulatory frameworks, the types of vehicles needed for a high net worth individual, a family office, or an institutional investor to finally have the right medium 
to access these types of projects, which those projects would have gone through a list of criteria before they met the, the measures for being an investment-worthy project. So we've seen those types of evolutions where we're seeing better quality, better access, and the most important part, a more educated crowd. And I think that is potentially the most impactful thing because it's that crowd that informs the newcomers in what to look out for, what to expect, and that goes beyond what the regulators are aiming to do. A big part of our education comes from the audience, the people who are digging into these projects, who are listening, who are learning, and who've had a few rugs pulled from underneath their feet. And, and I think that's, that's the wind of change that we're seeing, and of course, that's currently. But what we do know that's on the books is better frameworks that are, that are better informed in how to handle these systems. Is an ICO a security? Is a stable coin a currency? Which regulatory body should manage those events? Should Bitcoin or Ethereum fit within those confines? And how can an end user interact with that? What is the type of KYC mechanism an exchange should take on? And what is their CTF and AML policy as they allow a user to flow through their ecosystem? So we have seen the maturity in the platforms come about. And we've also, more importantly, seen a level of self-regulation by the community, where the community themselves now are observing projects from what could potentially be uh, an event that could end up hurting the end user or the investor. So if I could summarize in saying that the winds of change that we are seeing are more positive than they are negative, and they're more in a position to allow the retail user to have better protection and to allow the institutional investor to have better and more efficient vehicles uh, onboarding within this industry. Yes, I can grab a few important elements, which was KYC, another one that's complementary is AML, is factor regulations. Uh, there's things like, for example, custody services are becoming more important because if you're an institutional investor, you want uh, your keys or your valuables to be protected effectively. And I think there's other auxiliary services that are starting to appear, things like insurance. So for example, we have custody insurance being mixed together so that the assets are fully protected the same way, for example, a bank account is protected for up to certain uh, um, amounts. But of course, there's always a slightly different perspective. Family offices tend to be a little bit more conservative. Are family offices taking more risky steps in investment as we move forward? I think, George, the, uh, the amount of conferences that are happening comes with a lot of positives, you know. Um, if we want to talk about the local family offices, um, now is the question about what is what is Bitcoin? What How can we invest them? Because I think the cryptocurrency has proved itself over the years, um, at least since 2017 after, after the ICOs and, and what happened and on them, but overall, Everyone is talking about the about the cryptocurrency, and it's now about making sure that again we come back to the regulations, making sure that there are some right regulations for these family offices to start trusting, because obviously we're in a very trusting country towards its government. We trust the government a lot, and we make sure that whatever they have said we comply with. So this brings us back to the investment in a way that if if the right regulations were out, I think most of the family offices are going to tap into this, are going to tap into this industry because everything is there. The, of course, most of the family, all of the family offices, they do understand the risk and they do know that in in one day the Bitcoin price could dip down. So, but again, since everyone is is basically riding the wave, I think the family offices will, will be very keen on on being the leaders in that in that area. So right now it's it's a matter of making sure that those family offices understand and and monitor those projects, the cryptocurrency or the blockchain projects, 
very carefully and identify what are the legit ones as well. And th th at least this is what we're doing internally, making sure that we have the right intelligence to analyze each project. For example, our latest partnership with Casper Labs, uh, and we've been working with them on many government use cases as well, um, as their layer one protocol, um, we've, we've basically identified Casper Labs after a very long uh, period of time because of their protocol uh, and how useful it is to the government. So, uh, pushing in the right education to those family offices, I think it will it will be a key element point for uh, for their future investments and making Dubai and the UAE as an investing country because. Until now, the UAE has not been well known for uh, as an investment country, like as as a country where you come in with your project and you raise funds. It's a country where you come in and you deploy your technology and everyone can use it. But it's really good to create an ecosystem where the family offices could contribute in and turn UAE into an investment country and, and, and a fundraising country, because that will basically attract everyone from basically fundraising all the way to deploying the projects and deploying the technology and creating success stories. So I think this is the vision that the family officers should, should, should have. Actually, you brought the um, uh, connector to the last item of our discussion today, which is, I think, the important keyword, use case. The technology only becomes valuable when you have valuable use cases of this technology. Let me give you an example. One of the local companies, I will not name the name, implemented a blockchain transformational technology in the largest telecom operator around the world. Runs over 50 mobile operations. The result of this implementation allowed the use of smart contracts to have the relationship between this organization and its suppliers and the adjustments that get made as um, the deliveries get done and implemented. To make a long story short, this largest telecom organization, by implementation of blockchain and smart contracts, is saving or will be saving $400 million per year. So use cases matter, and this is one of the key elements. I had the pleasure, of course, of meeting people like Don Tapscott almost 27 years ago. He runs a company called BRI, Blockchain Research Institute, in uh, Toronto, and it's all about use cases, how we document. Well, the last point here, I want every uh, of our panel members maybe highlight one or two use cases they consider to be important in terms of impact of this technology, either in government, private, or even investment or finance. We we'll start with Paul. Sure. Well, the use cases are limitless. I, I think especially in government and in the financial sector where we need, we need exactly distributed ledger and we need the data to not be centralized for multiple reasons and as I already mentioned I think the example of the cross-border payments which was implemented on blockchain by the Saudi government as well as we see here we have the uh, most of the transactions going on blockchain the government transactions and it's much more cost efficient and it's very fast. Like there, there are multiple benefits of going through it. Uh, as well as, actually we have many startups here that have solutions uniquely uh, for, for payments and a payment can go in the traditional methods. You know, you can wait up to sometimes a week and many, many other issues with it, but uh, you can have constant payments uh, instantly. So you can have instant payments too. So this is for me is one of the best use cases. And as well the safety of data, like on the distributed ledger. So that's why I believe for government uses, use cases, that's um, that's one of the most valid ones, safety of data. I bet some use cases from your past experience. Well, rather than talking about my past experience, I could probably speak about the hopeful future experience. And that is one where we touch on the topic of regulation, but specifically cross-border regulation. We we're now seeing an environment being established of what does it look like for two countries to start collaborating on uh, cross-currency exchanging, bilateral currency swaps? What does it look like for security regulators to start exploring the ability for a nation like Barbados 
to take one of its securities and have it listed in the UAE, but from a using utilizing blockchain technology to enhance uh, the process and make it more efficient custody settlement and clarity of such settlement environment. What does it look like when we start exploring government-based technology? For example, a blockchain-based identity system. What does that look like when we borrow said technology between the United Arab Emirates and a nation like Barbados? Uh, and then it goes further into other types of new cases, our sandbox environment, where we have environments that consumers and entrepreneurs, businesses, can enter within a sandbox that hasn't been uh, fully formulated on what the idea could look like, can the same criteria of that sandbox be matched with another nation and then allow companies in sandbox A to enter into, comp into another jurisdiction in country B following the same criteria. So the use cases that I think of, George, are the ones that involve uh, multiple nations. And what does that look like in the future? And the reality is, as Paula rightly said, the, case, the cases, the use cases are limitless. And the way that I see the future moving now is, yes, domestic regulation is the cornerstone for the local economies, but I see this technology being very applicable in the cross-border sharing of data, information, knowledge, and regulatory practice. Yeah, I think we could have so many applications. As you know, we have so many fake COVID passports. It actually has become a business now. With blockchain, countries could eliminate this problem almost uh, immediately. We have the case also in Dubai where, for example, if you lose your passport through blockchain technology, they can also have your identity and your biometrics, and they allow you to have quick movement and not have to wait for months until you can leave the country again. So back to Jafar on some use cases that he would like to highlight uh, for us. Well, most of them fall under strict NDEs. <laughs> uh, but uh, what, I, what I really liked about working with the government since 2017, since the, uh, His Royal Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed bin Rashid, uh, initiated the blockchain strategy for uh, 2021. Um, all, most of the government entities have already established blockchain departments within their enterprise. Um, and this says a lot about their initiatives and what they want to do actually. Um, so one more thing that I, that I really uh, impressed me a lot is the creativity of the use cases that they are working on. Um, I think a lot of a lot of that has changed since people started to know more about blockchain and the usage of blockchain. Um, I think previously it was being done randomly, but now they are under identifying the right use cases for the for blockchain as a technology, and they're deploying it in the right uh, in the right place. So um, a lot of a lot of the use cases that that we're working on has so many challenges and the number one challenge I would I would really talk about is that for for the government entity to have a use case some of the other government entities as stakeholders should jump on the chain as well so I think like identifying all of those uh, use cases with the other government entities and put them in sync with each other is the number one challenge, uh, but of course, with the right technology, with the right team, with the right set of minds and advisors, things will progress. As the, basically, the initiative came from the royal family about the blockchain, and and uh, when blockchain center was created as well, all of that is to ensure that the government will be blockchain based enterprises um, as soon as possible. So. And that, of course, to save time, energy, money, and and I think Paula tapped into the to the happiness uh, ministry of happiness, or I think George, uh, I can't remember, um, which will of course impact the happiness of the people by by the technology, by the usage of the technology, and could increase the rating of those enterprises. So I think that most of the use cases that we're working on will be announced soon, hopefully, um, and and people gonna 
understand how the government is is going to be uh, is going to be deploying the blockchain and using the blockchain as a as a as a technology. But of course, the most important use case that everyone is is talking about is actually the CBDC. So I think this is something that will happen sooner or later, um, and and it's of course going to be regulated by the central bank, but. Um, in the right way, in the right time, um, and and we look forward to that. So. Yeah, you mentioned an important element, which was the blockchain center, which serves a lot for education, uh, a lot for helping drive regulatory, but in a balanced way, and also assisting in the implementation of the projects. By the way, I do invite you also, to, there's a very nice document, if you go blockchaincenter.ae, maybe I don't spell it correctly, uh, you see there's something called an implementation guide that is actually been translated both into English and Arabic as well. I think we're pretty much out of time, so maybe I'll give each uh, of the micro panelists here maybe one last word, maybe 30 seconds, and then uh, if we have time, maybe we'll go to one question from the audience. Please, Paula. Very stressful to pick in 30 seconds. Uh, so I just remembered uh, something that I missed to mention and I think it's very important. The specific licenses, doesn't matter, for blockchain, crypto, whatever. I, I can give the example of Bahrain when they opened the digital banking license. So many companies went there to get the license. So basically they will be able after that to attract investment. So in summary, number one, in terms of regulation, I think that UAE is in, on the very, very right track. And more specific licenses, like for example, for uh, for payments, crypto, or for digital bank, etc., etc., would bring in more companies. When more companies come in, then more investment comes in. When you give also the environment, so when these three factors come together, then we have a very successful uh, place for for blockchain or any sort of tech. Gabriel, any closing words? And thinking, Words of wisdom. And sticking with our theme, uh, digital transformation is indeed underway. And we can see it at all facets of society, from the regulators to the corporations, the government to the citizens. And what's exciting to me is the opportunity to see this technology, i.e. blockchain, implemented in the right way with the right mechanisms and the right types of projects. And I am excited about the positive change of, of events that we have been seeing over the years. And as everyone rightfully can see within the crowd, the United Arab Emirates is doing an amazing job of positioning, uh, positioning these events throughout the month and allowing these conversations to happen, which inevitably result in more quality and better projects. More quality control. Jafar, last words. Um, I think the UAE has succeeded tremendously in creating the right ecosystem and attracting the right people. So this will help us to reach to the next level, which are the regulations and then and then full implementation of the of those regulations. So I think we're on the right track towards that, and and things will fall in place in the right place at the right time. Um, and last but not least. George, I want to dedicate a few words for you and, and for the efforts that you've been putting in in this community. For those of you who, do, who, do, who doesn't know George, um, he's been active in the blockchain space and he's been hosting weekly uh, gatherings uh, and at EcoX along with his team. They have been doing a tremendous job in raising awareness and, and they have been doing it out of, out of their goodwill and out of, out of their passion towards this uh, community, so can we get a round of applause for George and the rest of the team? Thank you. Uh, actually, the, this last word I think is important, ecosystem. It means by yourself, uh, you cannot do everything. You have to cooperate with others. I think there's a very famous African proverb which says if you want to go fast, uh, go alone, but if you want to go a long way, go together. So I think ecosystem is quite important uh, to go a long way. So thank you for listening to us today. I think uh, the esteemed guests that I have with here, me today, prove the value that can be done from the events that we bring to you. 
with your cooperation. So do enjoy the remaining of the entire week and the entire month and make as many connections as possible. Thank you.